we go. Can everyone see that? I'll take that lingering silence as the affirmative. Um, okay, so um, thank you all for coming back and giving me a, another opportunity to ramble on about web scraping. The, um, the plan for this evening is um, we'll be talking about two sort of broad topics. Uh, the, one is, the first one is fairly short. Uh, that's we're going to be talking about the robots.txt file. And then the, the second is really sort of the meat of, of what we're going to be discussing, and that is using RVEST for uh, crawling a, a static website. And um, that, that's really the majority of what we're going to be talking about. And, and during the course of the, the RVEST segment, we're going to be looking at, at four um, specific examples or, or demos. Um, let's see, we're going to be uh, crawling some stuff from our bloggers. Uh, we're then going to be going and finding some out some interesting things about our members of parliament. Uh, we're then going to grab some data from Wikipedia for um, stars who've appeared on The Simpsons. And then finally, we're going to gather some information about the uh, altitude extremes uh, for various locations on Earth. And we're going to use that to just generate a little visualization. So. That, that's kind of where we're, we're headed. Uh, but let's kick off by, by talking about uh, the robots file. And this, this is not really a, a, so much a, a technical topic as a kind of, I guess, an ethical one, um, because one of the considerations that you should always have when you're doing web scraping is like, what, what is the impact that I'm having on uh, a website, firstly? And secondly, um, is, are the hosts of that website, is there any material on there that they particularly don't want us to crawl? And the robots.txt uh, file is a way that a, a website can specify what content they, they really would prefer you not to take a look at while uh, web crawling. Okay, so this robots.txt file uh, specifies what's known as the, the robots exclusion standard, which sounds like very grand and frightening, but basically it's it's a very, very simple uh, standard that determines the, the way that, that you can specify what um, what is and is not uh, available for, for scraping. And it's worthwhile pointing out that the contents of this file are advisory uh, in the sense that, that they're not enforced in any way, but it's just like, it's a polite request from the website uh, as to what you, you should or should not do while, while you're gathering information. Okay, so let's take a look at, at some examples because this is probably the, the easiest and um, most simple way to understand what this file looks like. And the, the contents of, of a, a robots.txt file consists of, of three possible items, the, the user agent, and every, every rule in the robots.txt file will specify a user agent. And I'll get back to exactly what that is in just a moment. And then there is either an allow rule or a disallow, or potentially both of those uh, acting together. So returning to this user agent, this is a, a string that basically identifies the, the, um, the entity that is sending requests to the website. So if you are in a, a Chrome browser, then your user agent string, which is part of the information that's conveyed to the server when you submit a request, will specify that you're on Chrome. And similarly, if you're on Firefox, that you'll get a user agent string that's specifically for Firefox. Now, one of the things that we're going to find out a little bit later when we're doing some crawling with RVEST is that it uses a specific user agent string that actually kind of flags it as being um, a, a crawler. Uh, and so potentially you might want to work your way around that. So let's have a look at, at, at a couple of, of examples of what these rules might look like. So this one at the top here is a, a very general rule in the sense that the user agent is specified by a star or an asterisk. So this means that this rule is going to apply to all um, requests that go to the site, regardless of what their user agent string is. And that the rule says that it's disallowing access to everything directly beneath the root of the site. Now, this sounds like a very sort of a restrictive rule, but you can have a disallow rule that basically blanket 
uh, uh, prohibits people from crawling the entire site and then you can have allow rules that will actually give them permission to uh, target specific areas of the site. So these things always need to be interpreted together. Here's a, a somewhat more uh, specific one. And in this case, we're saying that for uh, a user agent specified by web stripper. So this is obviously some particular web crawler that's systematically gathering information from websites. It is not allowed to, to uh, generally gather information from the website. And the final one here, uh, the user agent Googlebot. So this is one of the user agents that's used by Google and its crawlers as they navigate the internet. And this rule says that um, Googlebot should not go and gather in any information below the API section of the path, but that it can go and gather everything beneath the, the wiki path. And in principle, rules like this can be extended with many, many, many of these allow and disallow rules. We're going to see some actual examples of these files at presently. Okay, now maybe at this point it actually makes sense to just take a look at, at a robot stock text file. So let's pop out here and go to uh, wikipedia.org and take a look at robots.txt. Okay, so this is what your typical file uh, robots file looks like. And you can see here that there are a whole series of rules. All of these things preceded by hashes or, or comments just to make the, the contents of the file a little bit easier to understand. But you can see that there are a lot of rules in this uh, file as to who can look where on Wikipedia. Okay, so Back to the slides, um, obviously I, in an ideal world, we'd all like to be uh, uh, compliant with the wishes of the, the website host. And we would like to do this in code, right? Because you would be writing a, a web crawler that's gonna go and systematically harvest information from a website. And at the same time, you would like this crawler to comply with what's set out in the robots file. Um, so we need to have a way of integrating this information from the robots file into our crawlers. And fortunately, there's a very nice package called robots.txt, which you can install from CRAN, and that this will allow you to do precisely that. So the first thing we'll need to do, install the package, and then load it up so that it's, all of its functionality is available in our current session. And then we can start actually going and extracting information from the robots file. So for the examples in these slides, I'm uh, using uh, Reddit. So I've just defined a, a variable here, which is storing the, the base URL for Reddit. And here I'm exploring on the right hand side, two options for retrieving the robots.txt file. The first one is to use this get underscore robots text function. And what that does is it actually goes and retrieves the text content of the file, which can be useful. But what you probably want is actually the second function here, which is just the robots text function. It will go and retrieve the contents of that file and then actually pass it into a number of rules, which you can then query. So we're going to store the results from this robots.txt function in a variable called robots, and we're going to interrogate that in a moment. Now, the first thing we can do is take a look at which crawlers have specific rules for them. Okay, so you can see here, uh, well, so we, we do that by looking at the, the bots element in our robots uh, variable. And we see these, these are the various uh, user agents for which there are specific rules in the file. And over here at the end, there's this kind of blanket or wildcard rule that applies to all of them. We're gonna now take a look at some of the rules for specific um, bots or crawlers. And the first thing we can do is check on what rules apply to this bot called Voltron, which sounds quite sinister. So I'm calling uh, robots, it has a check method and I'm specifying that the bot is Voltron. The return value is false and this tells me that um, there is a rule in the robot.txt that the Voltron uh, crawler 
should not go and navigate uh, anywhere beneath the, the root of the site. Let's take a look at, at another bot, this one called Bender. Um, and in this case, uh, the check uh, function or the check method tells us that yes, Bender can go ahead and crawl the site. Now these are kind of top level rules that are applied in the robots.txt file. We can also be more specific about particular paths. And this is generally the way that you'd approach this. Um, if you're crawling across a site, uh, you've got to have a whole series of uh, paths on that site. And if you're wanting to be compliant with the robot.txt file, you would want to go and check for each of those specific paths, whether or not you have access. So in addition to the bot argument to the check method, we can also specify a particular path. And here we can see that although the Bender crawler has got global access to Reddit for this particular path, right, which is most particular to Bender, it's not available for, for crawling. Okay, so those, these are rules that pertain to particular bots or crawlers. What about the, the blanket rules? We can just specify either that bot equals the asterisk or the star, the wild card. And we can see that all bots are able to uh, uh, crawl content below the posts path. Uh, and we don't actually need to even specify this bot argument because that's going to be the, the default. So if we don't specify that, uh, we take a look at a different path, path equals API. We see that no bots are permitted from crawling beneath uh, the API path on the site. Okay, so that's enough background to enable us to actually play with these things. So let's uh, do that right now. And what we're going to do is take a look at the um, the Wikipedia uh, the Wikipedia robots file that we looked at just a little while back. If I can figure out. <laughs> How to minimize my browser. There we go. Okay, so um, this is the mm, 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 this is the the robots file that we're going to be interrogating now, and we're going to do this from within R. So I'm going to get my R session. Here we go. I create a new file for this, and the first thing I'm going to do is load up the uh, robots text library. And then I'm going to want to retrieve the, the robots.txt file. So I'm going to just create a, a variable storing the, the name or the URL for the site. Uh, let's go back to Chrome. So we don't actually include the robots.txt in the URL. So it's just the base URL for the site. And now I'm going to create a variable called robots and I'm going to use the robots.txt function and I'm going to specify that the domain, sorry, domain is given by the URL that I specified before. Okay, and that's going to go off and retrieve the contents of the, the robots.txt file and it's going to pass it so we have access to all of those rules. And we can now check uh, which uh, bots have or which user agent strings have particular rules applied to them. And you can see that there are a whole bunch of them, right? Because we saw earlier that there are indeed a whole lot of rules applied in that file. And we can now go and interrogate uh, these individually. So for example, we can go and take a look at a particular um, bot. So for example, let's pick one out, like site snagger sounds sufficiently sinister. Let's take a look at that. What are the rules for that? Well, it says that site snagger should not go crawling the site uh, at all. Let's uh, take a look at specific paths. So uh, robots check, let's say paths, paths is slash API. This is generally, you generally wouldn't want a crawler to be uh, poking around in your API. And that's indeed the case, right? So we denied access to the, the API path. Um, well, Wikipedia, you'd expect us to be able to at least traverse the, um, the wiki component of the site. So let's try this now with uh, wiki. And we see, aha, we can definitely uh, navigate beneath wiki on the path. 
And as, as this argument name implies, we can actually specify multiple paths at the same time. And this is quite handy because if you're going to be navigating across a whole bunch of um, paths on a site, it might be quite handy to uh, check up front which of those are permissible and which ones aren't and just use that for a bit of filtering. Uh, and I'm missing a closing bracket there. Okay, so here you see that it's just basically it's returned a vector with the results of applying uh, the check function to each of these paths individually. Okay, so that, that's all that I wanted to tell you uh, about using uh, robots. You're not going to see me using it again this evening because it just adds a little bit of extra complexity to building a crawler um, that that makes you know, doing a demo like this a little bit more difficult. But what I would say is that if you are going to be building a, a, a proper crawler, then taking into account the, the wishes of the robots.txt file is definitely uh, worth your while. Okay. So let's move on now to actually talking about uh, what's possible with um, our vest. So I'm going to go and close that and close that as well. I'll hang on to that. Okay. So our vest. Our vest is the, the preferred tool for crawling uh, static websites with R. And just as a reminder, um, there, there are two types of websites, the static and dynamic. And the principal difference between these is that for a static website, all of the content is rendered into the HTML document on the server. And that document is then delivered to you in its entirety, which means you can immediately start extracting content from it. At the opposite extreme, you've got dynamic websites where some limited amount of content is going to be rendered on the server and that HTML is going to be passed across to your browser or to your scraper, but embedded in that HTML will be calls to JavaScript and that JavaScript will then go and source additional information and render that content dynamically in your browser. So in other words, the, the page is really only being built in your browser rather than on the server. And from a web crawling perspective, these present two very different problems. Like the static sites are pretty easy because all of the content is delivered to you in one great big chunk. Dynamic sites on the other hand, because they're actually rendered in the browser, uh, pose a much larger cha challenge. We'll be talking about that challenge though next week. Okay. so. Let's, let's dig into our vest. Um, you can install it from CRAN or, or from GitHub if you want to live close to the, the bleeding edge. And the first thing you should do after installing it is loading up the library so that you have all of its functionality available to you. And I'm going to pull in at this stage two other uh, um, libraries which are, are super handy if you're, you're doing a web crawling or in fact, <laughs> many, many tasks in R. So deployer basically so that I can manipulate a data frame in a, in a very simple way. And then Stringer, just because it provides me with a, a selection of really useful functions for working with text content. Okay, so what is our general workflow going to be for, um, for scraping with RVEST? And we can break it down into four basic steps. So the first is to download the, the content of the web page. And as I mentioned before, these are going to be static sites. So the entire page is going to arrive in one great big blob. The second is that we're going to identify the portions of the page that we're interested in. And we're going to find the corresponding CSS selectors. So this is stuff that we spoke about last week. And I showed you that there are two, two principal tools for doing that. One is to use the developer tools in your browser. And the other is to, to use the selector gadget. Right. So once we've got those CSS selectors, we're then going to use the functionality in uh, our vest to actually extract the corresponding information from the page. And then finally, once we've got that information, we're going to do something with it. And generally for my purposes, this means that I'm going to take that data and stash it into some medium like a CSV file or a spreadsheet or a database. Right. So, for, for the purposes of, of these slides, we're going to be targeting this uh, page on Wikipedia, which um, has two nice big tables that document the change in the world marathon record for men and for ladies over time. 
And we're going to be extracting a variety of different information from these pages, uh, including some extracts from those tables. Okay, so point number one in, in our workflow is to go and grab the content of the web page. And to do this, we use the, the read HTML function. Now, as soon as you load our vest, the read HTML function is actually available to you. It's not really actually part of our vest. It's something that's inherited from the XML package, as you'll see in just a moment. And the argument that you specify to read HTML is the, the URL of the, the resource that you're wanting to retrieve. So here I've got the URL to the, the web page that you saw just a moment ago. And when you uh, execute that, you get back this object, which I've assigned to uh, Marathon. And if you check on the, the class for that object, we see that it is an XML document. And this kind of makes sense because as I, as I mentioned last week, uh, HTML is just a subset of this very general purpose um, uh, document format known as, as XML. And if we take a look at the actual content of uh, the returned um, object, Marathon, we see that it, it is indeed an HTML document. And here you should see some of the content that is familiar after last week. So we've got a, a top level HTML tag. And inside that, nested inside it, we have a, a head and we have a body. And most of the content that we're actually interested in, it lies here within the body. So our next task is going to be targeting specific elements uh, within that body and extracting the corresponding content. So what I'm going to do now is just open up this uh, URL in my browser as well so that we can uh, rummage around in it. Oops. Okay, so there's my web page. Right, so now that we've got the contents uh, in R, we're able to go and rummage around. And the way that we do this is by <laughs> the, the, the fancy term is navigating the DOM. The DOM is just basically um, it's document object model. And it, it's the, the way that the, the content of your HTML is laid out. As I mentioned last week, I think, um, you can think of your HTML document as being essentially a tree where you can start at the, the root node, so HTML up at the top here, and navigate down through the nodes um, in the, the document until you come to the, the content that you're looking for. And the way that we navigate from the root to uh, the content of interest is by using either CSS or, or XPath. So this is gonna be our next step now, is finding the, the right CSS. So, First thing we're going to do is um, pull out the information from the, the H1 heading. So the H1 heading is back here. It's this marathon world record progression at, at the top of the page. So we do that by taking our, our object, our page object, and piping it into the HTML node function. And the other argument, the second argument, because the first argument's coming through the pipe, the second argument is now the, the CSS selector that's allowing us to pick out that content on the page. Just to, to reinforce that, if we go take a look over here, we right click on that title. There you go, you can see that it's, a, it's an H1 tag. And it has an ID as well, which is another way that we could access that content. All right. So this function HTML node will then return to us a, a, a node object, which we can then go and interrogate further. And we're gonna do that in just a moment. But before we do, we're gonna take a look at, at a related function and that is HTML nodes. The difference between these two is that HTML node will only return one result. So even if your CSS selector matches multiple elements on the page, HTML node will only return one item. HTML nodes, on the other hand, will return all of the items on the page that match. So we can see here, if we look for all the nodes of type table, then we get back five results. If we had used table with HTML node, we would have got only back, back only one result and it would have been the first matching result. Okay. so. We, using the 
uh, HTML node and HTML nodes, we are able to identify or navigate to the content on the page that we want. The next step for us is going to be to actually pull out that content. So these are the things that we're going to be pulling out. We're going to be extracting the text from that main, um, main title on the page. We're also going to be pulling out the text for the first paragraph on the page. Okay. And then over on the right side here, on the right hand side, you can see this top image. We're going to be finding uh, the URL for that specific image. So we're going to start off with that title element. And the way that we get the text from that node is by taking the HTML node that uh, has just been returned to us and piping it into the HTML text function. It's got to go and extract the text content of that node. So if we go back, and take a look at our HTML. This is the content that is enclosed between the opening H1 tag and the closing H1 tag. So marathon world record progression. That's what we get back there. And we can do this at, at multiple levels. So in this case, it was quite simple um, because there is just simple text enclosed within that h1 node if we take a look at the first paragraph though right so over here we can see that it's a little bit more complex and nested within this paragraph tag there are actually a bunch of anchor tags so those are, are the um, links to other documents the nice thing about this html text function is that it will go and recursively extract the text from all of the items uh, enclosed. So here we've got the CSS selector for that first paragraph on the page. And we're identifying that node with HTML node and then taking the resulting node, piping it into HTML text, and we get the full text content of that first paragraph, regardless of whether it was part of a, a link or not. So for example, we can validate this uh, second sentence begins with world records and it's a link and we can see here there it is just rendered back to us as plain text of course we could also target those links and we'll see how we can do that in just a moment okay so getting the the, the content of a, of a tag is really useful normally this is going to be if you're you're grabbing a paragraph text or link text or text from it within a table. But very often the, the information that you're looking for is not actually enclosed within the tags or with, as tag content, but is actually captured as an attribute uh, for the tag. So for example, with these links um, that you can see here, we might be interested in the, the href, so the, the URL that the link is pointing to. We may be interested in the, the title attribute. How can we get that information back? Well, in order to do that, we replace the HTML text function with the HTML attribute function. And as opposed to HTML text, which does not accept a further argument, HTML attribute now does because you need to tell it which of the uh, attributes you're actually interested in. So here we're going to be grabbing the, the, um, the URL for that first image on the page that I pointed you to. So I specified the CSS as a dot image. So we're looking for a link and that link has got the image class. We can confirm that. I'm going to right click on the image, go to inspect again. And here you can see there is the, the A and you can see it's a and it's got the class of image and the href gives us a link to the actual um, image itself so we've got that back okay so that's that's how we get the information for a specific attribute what happens if we just we have a tag and we want to know what attributes are actually defined on it well, we can use the HTML attributes function to do that. And it will return a vector listing all of the attributes, right? It's a named vector. So we get back a vector with an, an href component giving us the, the link and also a class component giving us the, the class on that tag. Now, it's 
it's often the case that um, from a coding perspective, it's easier to navigate um, your, your document as a series of steps. And the nice thing about the, the HTML node and the HTML nodes function is that you can run them uh, successively after each other. So for example, you, if you start with your, your document, you're effectively at the, at the root of the tree. You can then run HTML nodes once, and that will then give you a subset of the tree. So maybe one or possibly many matches, and you can then go and search within those as well, right? And you basically by applying a series of these HTML node or HTML nodes operations, you narrow down to precisely what you're looking for. So for example, here, I'm starting with my marathon document. I'm then focusing in on all of the paragraph tags on the page. And then within those, I'm then looking at the only those that contain uh, links and now focusing my attention only on those links. Now, we could actually have achieved this in a single step where we could have just done HTML nodes and then made our CSS P space A. But this, uh, this approach of successively applying the HTML nodes or HTML node function allows you to actually write much more concise um, CSS. Because if, if you have a uh, if you have a situation where you're wanting to match a number of different possibilities on the page, then to write a single CSS rule for that, you're going to have to take all of those different possibilities and separate them by commas. But by using this recursive approach, you can actually um, divide that CSS up into chunks. And by using, by doing that, you can basically simplify the approach to getting down to the content you're after. Okay, so what I've done here, once I've got down to the, the anchor tags that I'm interested in, I'm extracting their corresponding text uh, and then looking at the head. So this is basically just giving me all of the, the anchor text for the first six um, links on the page. And we can confirm that world records marathon uh, IAAF. So there's world records marathon IAF as, as expected. Okay, um, let's, let's try some of this stuff out. So what I'm gonna do is we gotta go to our bloggers, uh, I forget, is that .com, .org, I'll Google it, that's the easy way, .com. Um, and what we're gonna target here is uh, this little table down here on the right hand side here jobs for our users. And what I'm ultimately aiming to get here is a data frame. And the data frame should have a column with the, the job title, and it should have another column with the, the URL for the link that it's pointing to, because you can see each of these is uh, a link. So I've got the, the script to do this, and we're gonna just run through that now. We're going to follow this up by an exercise where we're going to actually uh, code this uh, in, in real time. So the way that, that we go about doing this is we get to load up a whole bunch of, of libraries. So the most important one here is rvest. I'm pulling in deplier just so that I can work nicely with data frames. I'm using readr because at the end of this, we're going to be writing the results to a CSV file. And I'm using per because we're going to use a, a functional approach. I'm going to be writing a function and we're going to be applying or mapping it to a, uh, an iterable a vector. Okay, so once we've, once we've loaded up those libraries, um, the first thing we need to do is actually pull the content of the page and we do that with the, the read HTML function, right? And we supply that with the, the URL for the page. So we run that, it takes a moment or two, on my connection to download the content to the page. And now immediately we can start navigating to the content that we're interested in. Now here you can see the actual CSS selector that I'm using, but let's see how we would arrive at that by uh, going around the browser. I'm going to right click on the content that I'm interested in, right? And then I'm going to, I'm wanting to get both the, the title 
as well as the, the contents. So the contents is, is in this unordered list. Um, and I see that in the div above that, there is an ID. And as we know from last week, an ID uniquely identifies some content on the page. So by using this ID, we've immediately focused our, our attention only on this chunk of, of HTML, which is precisely what, what we're looking for. Okay, so what we do is we take our entire document and we pop it into the HTML node function. Node singular because we are only expecting to get one result back. And we provide it with the, the CSS selector, which in this case is the ID. Remember the ID is preceded by a hash. We grab the results, we store it in our bloggers jobs, uh, jobs. We take a look at that. We can see that it's the this is the outermost div, and within that we've got the H4 heading, which is just the heading at the top of, of the div. And then we've got this unordered list. Unordered list, that's really where our attention is going to be going next. Let's pop back to the document and take a look at these. So we've got our unordered list, we've got all of the list items, and let me see if I can make this a bit bigger. Ah, there you go. That's much more legible, isn't it? Um, within each of these uh, items, we've then got a, a link or an anchor tag. And that anchor tag has got the text content. So that's the name of the job. We're going to extract that with HTML text. And it's also got the href or the, the link to that the job description. We're going to want to have both of those, both the link and the, the text. So. We're going to firstly grab the, the anchor tags for each of those. And with that, we're going to, this is the, remember I said a moment ago that we have that, the opportunity to recursively search through the page. Well, this is precisely what we've done here. We first narrowed our attention only on that particular div by using HTML node. And we're now using HTML nodes to search within only that specific subset of the page. So we take our, uh, our bloggers jobs item, we pipe that into HTML nodes and we specify a, a very specific uh, CSS selector, which is an uh, unordered list with a child, uh, a list item, and that has a child of an anchor tag. All right, and if we take a look at that now, we've got a, a vector of five of those anchor tags and that number five ties up nicely with the number on the page, one, two, three, four, five jobs posted. Okay, and if we take a look at one of those in particular, so we can index into this vector, we're pulling out the first one, then we have that first node. And what we're gonna do is we're going to write a little function that can be used to extract the content from that particular node and we're then going to take that function and we're going to apply it systematically across all of the nodes. So this approach of running a function to do it makes a lot of sense. We could do this all kind of in line using uh, features from deployer and per, but by wrapping things up in a function, it allows us to be a little bit more flexible about the way that we extract that content. So our, our function is going to accept something called job and that job is going to be actually an, an anchor tag or an anchor node and it's then going to take that job and it's going to run the html text function on it so that's got to grab the the enclosed content of the tag that's going to be the job title and it's also going to go and grab the uh, the attribute the href attribute and that's going to be the link that that job is pointing to so it's going to grab those two pieces of content and it's going to wrap it up in a tibble. So this function is going to then return a tibble with those two pieces of information in it. So I've now just defined that function. If I run that on the first anchor tag, I get back a tibble with only one row, two columns, so a title column and a link column. The title has the job description and the link has got the URL for, for the job post. Now, we have a function that works for the first node. Let's just try it across all of the nodes. And to do that, we're going to use the, the mapdf function from the per package. So map, as you may recall, um, is would return a list. 
But if we use the mapdf function and all of the items in that list are data frames, then they get all concatenated together to form a single data frame, which is pretty much what we're looking for because we want to have a table with all of the results in it. So we can take our vector of anchor tags and pipe that into this map function. And it's going to go then and apply this extract job function to each of those anchor tags in succession. Sign the result to jobs for our users. Take it. There we go. Right. We've now got a table with all five of those job descriptions in it. It's got their titles as well as the, the corresponding URLs. And now for the final stage in, in our workflow where we actually do something with these data, I'm going to take the data that we've just crawled and I'm going to use the write underscore CSV function from the reader package to write it to this CSV file. Right, there we go, it's been written. And I think if I go up one level here, there we go. There's my data file with the information extracted from our bloggers. So in principle, I've got a script here, which I could now run every day, and it would go and extract the most recent R related job postings listed on our bloggers. Could be pretty handy. Right, let's, let's move on to something that's going to involve uh, some, some live coding. And what we're now going to do is go and extract some interesting, interesting information about our members of parliament. And Again, we're going to uh, oh, we're going to load up a bunch of packages. So we've seen deploy up per tidier. It's going to be important, from what I recall, for um, doing some wide to long or long to wide transformations. We've got stringer because we're going to be eliminating some uh, particular patterns, and of course we've got uh, our vest. So we pull those all in. And now we're going to follow the instructions, right? The first thing we need to do is go to the, the directory of the National Assembly. And here's its URL. So let's go and take a look at that. And important things that we are going to want to note is that first that each member has a, a card um, on that page and that these cards link to individual member pages. So if you click on one of those cards, it's going to take you to a page for the corresponding member. And, and on their personal page, there's going to be some useful information. So we're going to be aiming to get like their email uh, and their phone number at least. Right. So let's go and take a look at that web page. So there we go. So there are all the the folk in our National Assembly, and there are a lot of them. Okay, but that aside, um, you'll see that each of these cards is a link. And if I go and right click on one of those and open in a new tab, we can see that we're now going to get specific information for that particular member. And uh, when my internet connection graces me with a response, we'll be able to take a look at that content. In the meantime, while that's busy, I can go and take a look at the uh, content of this page because one of the things that we're wanting to do, uh, that we will be wanting to do is firstly identify each of these individual cards and within each of those cards, we're going to want to go and grab um, the link that's going to take us to their, their personal page. So this, div over there corresponds to the first claw, the first card. I'm going to just come uh, close that div. These are all of the divs for each successive card. And what we can see here is that they all have this class uh, single MP associated with them. So I'm guessing that a CSS selector that would just be targeting that single MP class would be enough for us to focus our attention on these individual cards. And once we've done that, we can then just burrow down and get the associated link. Right. We can go back and look at that individual page. And we can see here that on her page, we have a email address. And in this case, this is great because actually there are two email addresses listed here. We'll grab both of those. And there's also a phone number. Right, we've got to get that as well. 
Other things that we weren't going to want to get is like their name, their political affiliation, and a few other bits and pieces. Okay, so let's go back to our script. Now, the first thing we want to do is go and actually um, grab the directory page. So we've got a variable here, URL, in which we're stashing the URL for that page. And what I'm going to do is go and define a, a variable called HTML, and I'm going to use the read HTML function to pull in the contents of that page. So I'm now going to have all of the, the HTML contents of the, the front page. This should um, download quite a lot quicker than in my browser because it's not downloading uh, all of the other content like the images, etc. It's literally just grabbing the text content. Now, stage two is to extract the, the URL links for the member pages. And we already know how we're going to do this, right? We've got the, the, the CSS selector from our browser. We know or suspect that, uh, that it's going to involve this uh, single MP. So I'm going to hypothesize that I'm going to be able to do something like this HTML. I'm looking for HTML nodes that satisfy this CSS selector single MP. That's the class for the div. And within that, I'm wanting to have a child, an anchor child. So you can see that, that the, there's the div and the, the anchor is an immediate descendant. So we can use the, the child notation. So let's run that and see what we get. Aha, there we go. A whole lot of uh, anchor tags and each one of those has an href pointing us to that page. So step number two is to extract the URL links. So we're going to now go and use the HTML attribute function and we're going to request the href attribute. All right, so now we have all of those links to the individual member pages. I'm going to store that in a variable. I'm going to just call it parliament. Okay. Um, right, so next is Return the results as a tibble with a single column containing the links. Store the results in a variable called uh, parliament. I'm almost there apart from the fact that I don't actually have this as a tibble. So there we go, tibble. Uh, let's just neaten that up. Okay, uh, the tibble with a single column containing the links. Okay, so let's just make that column, we'll call it a uh, link. Um, right, and so now in my environment, I should be able to take a look at, um, there's Parliament, you can see there are 455 observations, so 455 um, of these URLs, and if we scroll down, they look all pretty much consistent, they're all in the same domain, so pa.org.za, but if we keep on browsing down, we might find that there are a couple of anomalies in here. Aha, there's one. Now, the problem with these anomalies is that they are not going to have the same consistent formatting that we can expect from the other pages on the site. So whatever rules we write to systematically extract the information from the, the personal pages, those rules are probably going to break for these URLs that are not consistent with the others. So what I'm gonna do right now is filter out the ones that don't match this pattern. Okay, so um, that's the pattern that I'm wanting to match, right? So that's gonna be at the beginning of the URL. Um, I'm going to use the filter function from Deplier. So I'm gonna have Parliament, and I'm going to filter out only those items um, that match this. So I'm going to use um, str detect from the stringer package. And you can see that it accepts two arguments. So the first argument is the string. So we're going to be searching on the link column. And the second argument is a pattern, right? And this is our pattern and we can be more specific. So this is a regular expression. I'm gonna anchor that at the beginning by just putting a caret at the beginning of the pattern. So if I run that, just check that we do get results back. Yes, indeed we do. And 
I'm going to take that and use it to overwrite my Parliament data frame. So I now have Parliament and you can see if we go down to the same location, which was somewhere around here, that that anomalous uh, link has disappeared. So these all have the same consistent format. So I think we're good there. All right. The next thing we want to do is write a function that will accept the URL from member page and extract the following information. So those are the bits of content that we are now interested in. And we want to return the results as a tibble. Um, and here a little warning, you'll need to cater for multiple phone numbers and email addresses because as we have seen, in this case, it's possible that there, there may be multiple emails and indeed there can be multiple phone numbers as, as well. Okay. So let's get to writing that function. So it's going to accept a URL. So uh, let's call our function pass member and it's going to accept a function, uh, accept a URL. So function URL and within that function, it's got to do a, a bunch of things. Um, firstly, it's got to download the content for that page and it's then going to extract all of these bits of information. Now, I'm going to be a little bit lazy here and rather than trying to write this function from scratch, I'm just going to prototype it on one of these URLs, uh, get that working and then I'll wrap the, the prototype code up in the function and then hopefully it'll, it'll work nicely for us. So the first thing I do is pull out a URL is going to be the first, uh, the first element of parliament. So there we go. URL is, uh, oh. <laughs> Parliament is a data frame, so it's going to be Parliament link one. There we go. So that's the URL for, for the first member. And what I'm then going to do is grab the content for her personal page, like so, right? So this HTML now contains the contents for this page. Right, and now we're going to start actually passing out the bits and pieces. So the first thing we need to do is get her name. So we're going to right click on her name. And I see that it's an H1, not surprising. It's the, it's the title of the page. So I can have here name is going to be uh, HTML. And I'm going to pack that into HTML node, right? Because firstly, I need to identify the node before I can extract any information. And once I have the node, I can then use HTML text to grab the enclosed information. So C name, right, that's precisely what I want. The only problem is that this leading space here really offends my OCD. So I'm gonna use something else from the stringer package, string squish, and that should strip off that leading space. There you go, nice and neat. OCD is back under control again. Um, so item number two, party affiliation. Aha, uh -huh. here we have it over there, right? So I'm gonna go and inspect that too. And you can see here, this is interesting. So this is actually um, in an unordered list as well. So potentially it seems the that the page caters for multiple party affiliations. I'm going to just assume that most people, or all people are actually only associated with one party. Um, and in that case, things should be a little bit simpler. So what we need to do is start off with this unordered list that has a specific um, class. We're gonna grab that class, so the party memberships class because we'll be using that in our CSS selector. Within that, we're gonna have an ally, and within that, we're gonna have an anchor tag, and we're looking for the text in that uh, anchor tag, so A and C. So next up is going to be the affiliation, so HTML. We're going to go and grab the particular node, so HTML node, and now I'm going to have ul dot the class that I've just grabbed, and with a child of ally, with a child of A, so that's getting us to the correct anchor tag. Let's check on that, right? That definitely brings us back uh, an anchor tag, and what we're wanting to pull out from that is the actual text content. So there we go, A and C, so we've now got a 
affiliation, right? Uh, next up is position. No, I don't even remember what the position was actually corresponding to. Let me just take a quick look at my notes. Uh, it's the title. Okay. Search in the page. No, that's not it. Ah, there we go. It's just got to do with, uh, yeah. What body they're in. Okay, so position title. This should be pretty easy because I assume that's unique on the page. But let's just search position title. Uh, I see. So there are actually two of these tags. The first one is for the current position and the second one is for the previous position. So formally, we can use HTML node here, even though there are multiple matches on the page because HTML node will bring us back only the first one. So we can now do this HTML and use HTML node and using that position title class, grab that. And we want to have the enclosing text as well, HTML text. Okay, National Assembly. And right. So I think, okay, phone number and email address. Given that we only have half an hour left of the session, I am going to make an executive decision here and discard the email address and just focus in on the phone number. The principle behind these two is, is more or less the same. So let's go back and look at the phone number. So this is the field that we want to grab. So I see, now this is interesting. So there we've got multiple unordered lists on the page. So email has got an unordered list, phone has got an unordered list but there's no way of differentiating between the unordered list for emails and the unordered list for phones, apart from relying on their position. So for example, this being like UL number two and this being UL number three. And the problem with using the position is that it really, it breaks very easily if you have um, other pages where there are other items uh, in, in the hierarchy. So. Ideally, we'd like to choose a, a slightly more cunning way of getting this information. And fortunately, we see that the, the phone number is actually enclosed inside an anchor tag and that that anchor tag has got an href attribute that begins with tell. So we can use the, the CSS select that we learned about last week um, that allows us to match on attribute values. So we can match on an, an attribute that begins with the string tell. Let's see how that's gonna work. So I'm going to do this, so HTML. Uh, once again, picking out HTML. I'm gonna choose HTML nodes because as I mentioned before, it's, it's possible that there are multiple phone numbers. HTML nodes. And now we're going to have, it's an anchor tag and we're going to have the href starting with uh, tell. Let's see what we get there. Aha, there's our phone number, right? And from that, we just want to pull out the HTML text. Great. Okay, so now, now that we have that working, let's just go back to the, this and see if we can find an example which has multiple phone numbers just so we can figure out how to string those things uh, together. Um, right, but while those are loading, we can go back to our studio and wrap all of this up into a tibble. All right, so there are the components of my tibble. This is gonna be the phone number. Let's turn that up.
Okay, so there's the information on that particular member. Let's see if we've got some people with multiple phone numbers. She's just got one, 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 one. Huh. Okay, so let's just think about what we would want to do if we had multiple phone numbers, because I don't really have the time to search around for an example. Um, this this is because we've used HTML nodes, this is going to return to us in principle, a, a vector of values, right? Um, and what we'd like to do, let's, let's simulate this. So if I have two phone numbers like so, 111 and 222, I want to take these and concatenate them together in such a way that I can slot them into a single cell in my table. And the way that I can do this is by using the string collapse function collapse is it string string C that's it and we need to provide it with the collapse argument okay there we go so what this is going to do is going to take the individual elements in this vector and it's going to concatenate them together with a semicolon separating them so number one number two so we can take this operation and just pop it on to the end of our phone numbers. And that should, in principle, handle the case that we've got uh, multiple phone numbers. So now we can take this content and pop it into our function. And that should do everything that's required. So let's check that out, pass member, and we'll pass it the URL for the first member. There we go, all of the information for her. So, um, great. Um, maybe we should test it on another one, just to be sure. So let's do parliament link two. Right, that also looks good. Um, so now we're ready to, to proceed. What I'm going to do now is to apply this function to a random sample of five members. Okay, so in this case now, possibly we're going to see whether or not this uh, phone number extraction actually works. So I'm going to take my parliament and I'm going to sample uh, five items at random and I'm then going to pipe them into my function. Um, so I guess there are a couple of ways that I could go about doing this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use mutate uh, to create a data column. And that data column is going to be populated by doing um, map of the link column with the pass member function. So inside my mutate, I've got map and what map is doing is applying this pass member function that we've just laboriously written to each of the links in the table and assigning the results to a column called uh, data. And um, let's call this random five, right? Let's give that a whirl. So it's gonna go and grab the information for five uh, members of parliament and they are going to be returned as a new list column in this data frame. Okay, so this list column, the list column actually has captured all of the, the individual tibbles, one for each of those, and we can then take that and we can unnest it. Um, and we have to say calls is data. That should do it. Okay, so there we go. And we've there got data for five randomly selected people from Parliament. Um, so it seems to work for, for a random selection of five. What we can now do is go and apply it systematically across the entire list of parliamentarians. And if, if all goes according to plan, we'll get back all of their, their names, affiliations, and, and phone numbers, which could be handy information to have, especially if you've got grievances that you want to have aired. Okay. So, simple illustration of how we can meaningfully extract data from a website using RVEST. Let's go back to the slides and take a look at some other things. Um, I'm going to close off a bunch of these things. 
So the next topic that we're going to be looking at in RVEST is grabbing data from tables. And as I mentioned, the, the Marathon's uh, record progression page has two of these big tables, one for men and, and one for women. And this is what the men's table looks like. We're going to be aiming to grab all of these data from the table. And I'm going to be showing you two approaches to this. One is using kind of a very granular approach uh, to basically pulling out information from individual cells. And then we get to uh, find out about a function that allows us to do this in a very much simpler way. Okay, so what we're gonna do for starters is use the HTML nodes function to just extract the, the those two tables from the page. So I've gone and found the CSS selector. So they're both tables with this particular wiki table class. And after we execute that, we get back a result that consists, as you would expect, of two tables. And now the next steps for us are going to be to focus our attention on one of those tables. So we're going to pick out the first one, which is for the men. And we're then going to go and extract content for the, the content from the table, right? And the way that we could do this is by going and picking out the CSS selectors for individual cells. So for example, here, I'm taking this table, Marathon Men, and piping that into HTML node and giving it a CSS selector, pick out a the first, the first because it, I'm using HTML node, so the first row, and within that, the first uh, header field, and pipe that into HTML text. That gives me back the header for the first column, time. I could then go and extract the first value from that column, which is gonna be 255.18. And if we go back to our table and look very, very carefully over on the left-hand side here, you can see that is indeed the first value in the time column. We could then go and do the same thing for the second column. We could find the, the column title and we could find the corresponding uh, first entry in that column. And we could proceed in this fashion to extract all of the information from that table. But I think you might appreciate that this would be a rather laborious undertaking. So fortunately for us, the clever folk who developed um, RVEST have wrapped up all of that functionality into a single function called HTML table. And all we actually have to do is take the, um, the node for the table and pipe it into this HTML table function. And when we do that, we get back the entire data set for that, for that node. So we get back uh, a data frame. So checking on the class, it's a data frame. And I've just taken that data frame and shuffled the columns around a little bit. So they're in what I think is a more sensible order. And then uh, pipes it into head. So we only see the first six records. And here you can see there's the entire first record. So Johnny Hayes 255 in 1908. And we can validate that that is indeed what it is. So Johnny Hayes 255 in 1908. Okay, so using this approach with the HTML table function is super robust and it allows you to really get information off a web page very, very quickly and very easily. Okay, so. Let's do a, a quick demo, um, a bit torn as to whether to do the demo or the exercise given the amount of time. Let, let's do the demo. The demo is kind of fun. Okay, so what we could do is um, go and scrape some information from two Wikipedia pages. Unfortunately, the, the information about the Simpsons guest stars is actually split up over two pages. Uh, but fortunately for us, the layout of those pages is very similar, which means that we can reuse our code across them. So let's take a look at how that is going to be done in, in practice. So again, loading up a, a bunch of packages. The only new one here is uh, Janitor, and we're gonna use Janitor to clean up the, the column names. And we have two URLs. The, the first one is for the, the old shows, so seasons one to 20, can you believe it? more than 20 seasons of The Simpsons. And the second one is for the more contemporary seasons. All right. 
So despite the, the superficial similarity of these pages, uh, they both have this image at the top of them, the actual content is different. So this is for the older uh, seasons and this is for the newer ones. You can see the same image, but if you scroll down, you find that these are for season 21 and forward. The tables have exactly the same, same layout though, which means that for, for crawling purposes, this is pretty straightforward. So let's load up those packages and then define those two URLs. And we have, I've written a little function here that's, that's just going to do a, a little bit of cleaning work for us. Um, and it's actually using this, this function, uh, XML find all, XML add sibling and XML remove. And these, these are functions actually from the XML package. So they're not part of RVEST, although they're inherited into RVEST. And what they enable you to do is basically a very low level editing of the content in your uh, HTML document. And the reason that I have this in this function is because um, there are cases and let me just see if I can find one um, where you like this one here, where you have multiple entries in a cell and these entries are actually separated by a, a, a break tag. So the BR tag, and it's very difficult to actually pass uh, that content with uh, where the separation is uh, just a break tag. So what I've done here is to simply replace this break tag uh, with a, a semicolon. So rather than having these in separate cells, they're going to be separated by semicolons in, in a single cell. And that just makes the, the passing a whole lot easier. So inside this function, in, in addition to uh, getting rid of those uh, line breaks, we're firstly going to be accepting a URL. We had to read in the content to that URL and assign it to a variable called HTML. We then go to pick out all of these wiki table uh, nodes and then select only the first one. And now looking at this code objectively, I realize that this is a little bit redundant because I could have just used HTML node here and it would have given me the first table. Um, and the result of that is then piped into HTML table, which should give us back a nice uh, table of results. So let's run that as it stands and take a look at the results and all right given how long it's taken to execute i'm not going to go back and modify it but this is what i meant we could do that and get rid of that oh, looks like i'm going to have my chance since this second one reached a timeout before it downloaded anything so i'm going to redefine that function now with my modification and try again. Uh-huh. So let's see if that worked. So I've got guests old. Uh, maybe we should head that. Okay, and guests new. Okay, and you can see that they have the, the same column layout. But if you look at these column titles, they're precisely the same as the column titles on the actual page, right? But from a, an R perspective, column titles with uh, punctuation and spaces in them are, are not cool, right? So we're going to want to, to deal with that. The first thing we got to do, though, is take um, our, our old guests and our new guests and concatenate them together into a single data frame using the R bind function. And then we got to take that and convert it into a, a tibble. So we drag ourselves out into the 21st century. And then we're going to remove the, the original uh, two tables. So we can do that now. And we end up with a single table of guests. So we see here that there are 1,451 observations in that. And this is what the data looks like. We still got those nasty uh, column titles with um, uh, punctuation characters and spaces, but we're going to deal with those shortly. So the first thing we're going to do is precisely that. We're going to tidy up the, the columns, take a look at the column names. You can see the spaces and the punctuation. We're going to get rid of those by using this clean names function from the, the janitor package. 
So I'm just going to break this down for a moment. Take our guests, pipe into clean names, and then take a look at the resulting names. All right, you can see that the spaces have been replaced with underscores and that the punctuation has also been replaced with underscores and that everything has been converted to, to lowercase. So I, I'm pretty happy with how this is looking, but there are a couple of things that I'm wanting to tweak. Firstly, this role underscore s, I don't like that. And I'm going to replace this no, because that could be the opposite of yes with number. And I'm going to uh, replace product prod code with production code. It'll just give me a slightly more user-friendly set of columns. And then I'm going to use the select operation to just shuffle around the, the order of those columns. So after that, if I take a look at my guests, right, I have um, much better column titles, but there's still, there's still some issues here, right? Firstly, I see that in my episode title column, I've got string data, but the string data actually contains embedded quotation marks. So I've got effectively quotation marks within quotation marks. We're going to want to get rid of those. We've also got these footnotes from the page. So you can see that many of these episode titles have these uh, footnote texts. We don't want to have those. We've got to get rid of those as well. So I'm going to use the mutate operation from deplier and clean things up. And this, this is a very standard component of, of web uh, scraping. And that, that is that the, the data you get back from the page is is, is probably not precisely the, the format that you want it in. So you are going to spend a little bit of time kind of massaging it into the right format. So this is just a, an illustration of how that might be done. So I'm mutating my guests data. And the first thing I do is have two operations to remove uh, the footnotes. And I'm doing that using the, the string replace operation from the, the stringer package. So the first argument to string replace is going to be the data. So either episode title or guest star. And then I have a pattern that I'm matching. And this is a regular expression. Um, so I, I have a, a literal opening square bracket followed by anything followed by a literal closing square bracket. And it's anchored with this dollar at the end of the string. And I'm replacing that pattern with the empty string. So that should get rid of any footnotes in the episode title and guest star columns, because you can see in the guest star column, we also have these footnotes. Um, the next thing is to remove the, the quotes. So we want to get rid of these embedded quotation marks. And again, we're gonna use exactly the same tool. Uh, we're gonna use string replace, but now rather than just string replace, we're gonna use string replace all because we're gonna be making more than one replacement within a single uh, string. The pattern that we're going to be matching is a literal quotation mark, either at the beginning, so anchored with a carrot, or at the end, anchored with a dollar. And again, we're gonna be replacing those with the empty string. And then we're gonna just do a couple of other little items of tidying up. Um, this one here, we're replacing the, the slash in the, the roll column with a semicolon. And here for this particular uh, star, um, I think these are just two names that he goes by and I'm focusing in on just a, a single name. I think it's because he appears in multiple places and in some places this Raja is included and others it isn't. I don't recall the exact reason for that. Okay. so. If we run that now and take a look at our guests, we have a nice data frame where all of those footnote, footnotes have disappeared and the, these, the episode title no longer has the embedded quotation marks. And we're now in a position where we can actually start to, to do things, but um, we, we run into a problem where we've got columns like role where we have multiple values and, and and this means that our data is not tidy right we want to have these multiple values as separate rows so for example in this particular episode we see that Marsha Wallace plays both Edna Crabapple as well as 
Miss Mellon. So if we were wanting to do um, analysis on this data set, we'd really want this to be two records, one with Marsha Wallace playing Edna and with the other with Marsha Wallace playing Miss Mellon. And what we're going to do here is a, a kind of a two-step process. Um, that I th we could actually have done this directly using tools from Tidier, now that I come to think of it, but this is another approach to doing the same thing. Um, I'm going to take this roll column and I'm going to run string squish. That's going to remove uh, empty white space at the beginning and the end. It's also going to reduce multiple white spaces down to a single white space. So for example, here I've got a semicolon followed by two spaces. Those two spaces are going to be reduced down to one. And I'm then going to use the string split function and provide it with this argument, semicolon followed by a space. It's going to take a string like this and split it into a vector of two elements, Edna Krabappel and another element for Miss Mellon. So if I execute that now, take a look at the results, I find that this last column here has now been converted into a list column. And it tells me that uh, it's a list of uh, character vectors. And the first character vector has two elements. Well, that makes sense because we split this into two items and the rest have only one. If we want to unpack the data in this roll column, we just got to use the unnest operation from deplier. And we now have uh, our data frame where that first record has now been split into, into two. Okay, and now that we actually have our data, we're into the final step of our workflow where we actually get to do something with those data. So we can answer the question, which guest star has appeared most frequently on The Simpsons? And we do that by counting the, the number of occurrences of that guest star and then ar arranging them in descending order. And we see, not surprisingly, that Marsha Wallace, since she played two, two characters, occurred in um, 177 uh, occasions. Although um, probably on many of those occasions, she was in the same episode, just as two different characters. Okay, I don't know whether this is a particularly useful analysis, but I found it to be quite a lot of fun. So I know I've got only four minutes left. Um, and in that time, I just wanted to show you um, another feature from, from RVEST, which is kind of useful to know about um, for, for next week, because next week we're going to be using Selenium. We're going to be effectively driving a browser. Uh, and this means that the way that we're interacting with a, a website is going to be very different to what we've been doing today. Um, so the, the way that we've been proceeding today is we've been just submitting a single request to the website. The website has then been answering with a statically rendered HTML, which we've then been processing. If we wanted to go and get more content from that website, so for example, the um, members of parliament analysis, we've then gone and submitted another request to that website. But there's been sort of no uh, persistent interaction between uh, R and the website. However, it is possible to do this kind of persistent uh, interaction uh, using RVEST uh, and sessions. And you can think of a session as being like literally a, a, uh, a contiguous series of interactions uh, with a website. And the way that we create a, a session is by using the HTML session function. And you can think of this as like basically going into a browser and going to a particular URL. And we're now going to apply uh, operations to the session that, that are going to allow us to navigate from that uh, that root page on on that website. So we start off by creating the session, assigning it to a variable. We immediately check the URL associated with the session and we see that, that it is indeed the one that we requested. We can now do some, some navigation using the session. So for example, I can go from my root page on Wikipedia and I can use this jump to operation, which is going to jump to a path on the same website. So notice here, I don't specify the, the fully qualified URL to get to this particular path. I know that this is on the site that I'm already talking to. 
So I can actually just specify the path relative to, to the root. And if I take a look at the resulting URL, I see that I'm still on Wikipedia, but now rather than being on the root, I'm now at a particular path. We can take this another step further. We can go and actually have a look at the browsing history associated with this session. So I can see that the session started off uh, at the, the root and I then jumped to a, another path on the same site. I can also jump back by using the back operation. So I've gone to that particular page, uh, which is a search about web scraping, and I've now gone and jumped back. And if I then check on my session history again, I can see that these two pages are still in my history, but this little marker over on the left-hand side here indicates that I am now back on the original page, whereas over here I was on the, the new page. So if, if you are interacting with a site and you would like to uh, maintain a consistent session, so if, for example, you've had to specify some particular headers when you make the request to the site, or you've had to set up some uh, particular cookies for that site, then using a session is the way to go because all of that information is going to be wrapped up in this session object. But the final thing that I wanted to show you here relates back to, to the, the robots.txt that we were talking about at the beginning of the session and this user agent, which is a string associated with your, your browser. Um, we, we can get the, the user agent for a browser. Well, you can get it in a variety of different ways. I rather like this one using HTTP bin. Um, if we go to that, it will tell me exactly what the user agent string is for my browser. So let's make that a bit bigger, right? So that uniquely identifies my particular browser. And we can do this um, in, in R or our vest by creating a, a session and then going and interrogating that session. So this session has got a whole bunch of nested objects and we ultimately dig down to take a look at the user agent that's been applied to this request via our vest. And we can see that it doesn't look anything like a browser user agent string. It tells us that it's associated with libcurl and rcurl and httr. So this means that any kind of request that we're submitting from R is, is very, it's gonna be very easy for a server to identify as being kind of a not browser associated request. So if we want to actually spoof a browser, what we can do is we can specify the, the user agent that we want to masquerade as, and I'll show you how that is done. So we can set up a variable that captures the, the user agent string that we want to appear as. And this is precisely the user agent string for, for my browser right now. And then what we do is we pull in the HTTR package and it has this user agent function. And we use that as the second argument to the HTML session function. And now if we go and check on our user agent string by using the same incantation, we see that um, from the perspective of the website, we are now Firefox rather than R. So if you are wanting to fly a little bit beneath the radar and you don't want to appear to be scraping, then one of the first things that you want to do is set your user agent string. There are many other things that you can do, but the user agent string is definitely one of the first things that you should do. And I think given the time, I'm going to leave it there. Um, as, as I mentioned before, next week, we're going to talk about uh, building uh, crawlers with Selenium. Uh, Selenium is an awesome tool. It can be a little bit fragile because you, you've got to handle the fact that um, Content is going to be rendering in the browser and this could either happen very, very quickly or in my case, rather slowly, depending on how brisk your internet connection is. So the second topic that we're going to be looking at uh, next week is uh, ways that you can ensure that your crawler is robust. So in other words, allowing for the fact that um, a particular request might fail 
and how to recover from that failure. Thank you very much.